Today marks the official release of Blender 5.0, arguably one of the largest and most anticipated updates in the history of the program. In this video, we're gonna take a look at some of the coolest new features and workflows that Blender 5.0 has to offer. So sit back, grab a coffee, and let's check it out. Okay, so here I am in Blender 5.0. I'm actually in the beta version of Blender 5.0, but as of the release of this video, the full long-term service version of Blender 5.0 should be available. So the first thing I wanna look at is just some overall UI updates. Uh, there's more color. There's these nice little highlights of color in this little keying tab here. You can see my little colored collections that I have have this nice little black outline. If you tab in edit mode for an object and you right click and you were gonna add a bevel weight or a crease, there's these nice little color options here for some of those. And then in addition, like if I drag out a window for the shader editor, so I'm just gonna click up here and press S, the nodes and the uh, little connecting noodles for the shader editor and also for geometry nodes have been updated. The text is a little bit more compact. There's more detail and more information in which shader or which node you're using. So there's new sockets that kind of tell you what type of data you're passing along, which is really nice for people that are using a lot of geometry nodes. And then also just in the main viewport, uh, if you press G to move something, the little tool tip here at the top middle that you see with the change in transforms used to be over here in the top left and now it's kind of up here in the middle, which is nice. And then also the little small things like over here in the end panel, there's a new design for your little buttons here. Um, just overall, everything feels very sleek and really enjoyable to look at. Okay, so the next big feature that we need to talk about changing just if you look at Blender Viewport is the integration of the dope sheet and the timeline editor. So typically at the bottom, you would have had your timeline as your you know most standard if you're opening the layout version. The timeline editor would have been here, whereas now you're gonna see the dope sheet. And overall, this function is very much the same as the timeline editor. There is this little summary section here that will have your different actions for editing. Uh, so for example, I have down here at the bottom, this used to be kind of up here in this little section, but now it's kind of basically stuck at the bottom for this little playback. Uh, there's the little skip forward buttons and such, but I have mine set to 60 seconds or 60 frames. And then if I just move this over uh, six meters, press I to do an inset keyframe. And then if I press down here to go to the end, and then let's just move it GX12 across, I'm gonna insert another keyframe with I. Uh, and then basically now I have a uh, animation that goes from you know negative six to six and 60 frames. And then just like you would have done in your timeline editor, you can grab that keyframe, do GX to bring it over. And then now it's gonna move in 30 frames instead of 60. So overall, this is not a huge change. Um, there's not a lot changing in the way that this would work. You would still obviously be able to press this button here and do E to get to your graph editor if you wanna change it in a graph editor standpoint. But yeah, just to help make Blender be a little bit more similar to Maya and other software that called this essentially this functionality a dope sheet, there's now gonna be a dope sheet instead of a timeline. So when you jump into Blender, that is one kind of big change that you'll see. There's not gonna be a timeline. All that is gonna be done in the dope sheet. So yeah, that's also another big change in the UI. Okay, so now let's get into some of the big workflow changes in Blender 5.0. The first one that we're gonna look at is the new scatter on surface. So to demonstrate that, I'm gonna do Shift A, add in a mesh plane. I'm gonna make some landscape here. So let's tab into edit mode, press S, and then do 10 to make this a 20 by 20 meter plane. So then over here, I can add a modifier. So I'm gonna add, uh, in the generate section, you're gonna see the new array modifier. You're gonna see the new uh, scatter on surface, and you'll also see the new curve at two. But the first one we're gonna talk about is scatter on surface. So by just simply adding that, it's gonna basically do a scatter system on this plane. So it's super handy to not have to go either have a pay to add on or go create a geometry node system for this. So then you could obviously control the amount of distribution on here. You can change it from a density slider. Um, you can just crank that up to get more instances. You can also change the algorithm that basically distributes those instances on this plane. And then for me, another really handy one is just to set the exact amount. So let's just say I set this to 15,000. And then to replicate a like a landscape, I'm just gonna pull over from the top right. We're gonna drag out a asset browser window. So I'm gonna press uh, the little icon up here and then press A. And then I'm gonna go to the botanic ingon add-on that I use for a lot of my uh, environments or plants. One thing I do wanna point out in Blender 5.0, if you go to the edit preferences for file paths, for each of your collections, it may need to be updated from link or pack to append. Basically what it's doing is in the default, I believe is gonna be set to either link or append or link or pack. And then when you drag them in, you're not gonna be able to move them. They're gonna have a lock to transform. So make sure you set that to append for it to kind of act like you would expect in previous versions of Blender. So I'm just gonna grab uh, this little grass frost. Well, let's grab something a little bit taller. Let's grab uh, I don't know, let's grab this one right here. I'm just gonna drag it in. And then on this plane, I can just take my object collector, I can grab the grass and then bam, we're gonna get this nice little setup. And then what's really cool is because we have this functionality built into our array modifier or our scatter on surface, we can now go through and randomize this. 
So if I select this here and I go down to transform, you're gonna see this randomize option here. I can just select it and then you're gonna get all these super cool options to transform. So just to show you what this graph looks like, I'm gonna jump into rendered view. And then obviously I think I'm gonna want more. So let's crank this up to like 30,000. I could also probably change the scale of this. And then you're seeing a lot of repetition here. So then if I turn on my randomize and set this to 360, now each of those is gonna have a random rotation. You can see how that really breaks that up. And then I would also probably just grab these two and like give them another little bit of rotation. So yeah, basically you're able to go in here and uh, scale, um, change the randomize of the rotation, basically anything you wanna do here. So this is the new uh, scatter on surface add-on. And then just looking at this grass, I would probably, first of all, let me turn this back up to two. That's just my world strength to see this a little better. And then on this instance, I would probably drop this down to maybe like 15,000. And then I might go in here to my scale and scale this grass up by two. Uh, so yeah, you get a super nice effect. And then you can obviously go in here and you know, if you have too many instances, I could set this to something like 7,500 maybe. And then, yeah, you can give it a nice little grass material. There are also masking options here. So if you drop down this masking, you could turn this on and you could either use your UV map. You could also just create an image mask. You could also do a texture weight paint and then save that as an image and drop that in here. Uh, so super, super handy. This is going to be really neat for people to not have to go either use a paid add-on or a whole geometry node system uh, just to create this type of stuff. So really cool, really cool system here. Okay, the next one that we're gonna talk about is the new array modifier. This is a really huge um, improvement to Blender 5.0. So to demonstrate this, I'm gonna do Shift A and add in a cylinder, and then we're gonna go to add modifier, and if you go to generate, um, you can just see the old array modifier marked as legacy, but this new one is the improved one, so we're just gonna do array. And then I'm gonna kinda work right to left and quickly show you how to handle um, these gizmos. The very rightmost crosshair one, if you drag out away from your center, that's just gonna increase the count and you'll see obviously that it's updating over here as we go. And then the little cone in each of your axis directions is gonna change the offset. So then you could do that to increase the X offset. We could also do this to increase the Z offset. And then uh, if you do the same thing, you can change the rotations. And what's cool is this is acting from the center. So it's gonna in offset this one by a certain amount and then it's gonna add that and so on. So that's really neat little functionality there. And then again, another really powerful deal with this is instead of you know just having an array in a single direction, we can now also randomize it. So I think I saw a Blender Guru video where he made some like fence posts or something. So for me, let's just say I wanted to create a column, like maybe it's a Roman like temple or something. So I would just drag these columns out like this. And then instead of them being perfectly up, you know, upright, I might say, okay, this is gonna be a little bit damaged. I can then check on randomize and then I can just play with the rotations down here until I get something that looks a little bit wonky. So if I go in top view, you can see as I rotate this X rotation, they're gonna, you know, vary slightly that direction. And then I would also probably do rotate Y or Z, give them a little bit of rotation there. So yeah, basically just a super powerful um, built-in randomize for that. And you can create all kinds of effects with this. Like, you know, you can have them all leaning down this looks like a bookshelf to me already. Like the possibilities are just absolutely endless for how you set up these pieces. And I've also seen people do like staircases. You can do MoGraph type stuff. So just a really powerful new array modifier. Another thing that's super, super common is if you're doing modeling or any type of radial array, um, you used to have to do a whole separate workflow for that. But now you can just go to your add modifier, generate array. We can change it from line to circle. And then basically this little toggle here changes your distance away. The little cross here it can be slid up and down to add more instances. And then again, you have your same ability to randomize your rotation, do all that good stuff. And then there's also the curve. So right now it's going to go empty because I don't have a curve. But if I do shift A and add in a Bezier curve and scale that up, I can then grab that cylinder and say, hey, it's going to be referencing this curve right here. And then you could obviously go in here and you could change um, the rotation of your cylinder to match. I'm just gonna hold control and set this to negative 90. And then it's all dynamic. So I could grab the Bezier curve and then grab any of these pieces and move it around, super cool. Also, this is another little pop of color in Wonder 5.0. I think they have different colors based on the different handle types of what your curve is. So that just helps you see like if you're using it for a rig or something, it's really handy. And then the last other version of this is the transform. I actually haven't played with this too much. It has a lot of similar features from the, the line, but I think it just gives you a little bit more uh, flexibility for that. So yeah, this new array modifier is super cool. And I think a lot of people are gonna enjoy using this workflow to do array and to also do modeling and just tons of cool stuff.
All right, if you're watching all these awesome updates that are available in Blender 5.0 and you're thinking this looks incredible, but I have no idea where to start, we got you covered. School of Motion's Blender for 3D Artists course will get you comfortable in Blender in just a few hours. My buddy Elijah, aka Sweet Boy Motion, breaks it down in a way that actually makes sense for us 3D motion designers. And honestly, with all these new features dropping, there's never been a better time to dive in. Plus, if you grab an all-access pass, you'll get access to even more Blender courses we've got coming very soon. All right, let's get back to it. Okay, another really awesome feature that we're getting in Blender 5.0 is the new Curve to Tube modifier. So I'm gonna do Shift A and then add in a Bezier Curve just for the example. I'm gonna scale this up a little bit. And then we go to our modifiers. Let's add that new modifier. So I'm gonna press Add Modifier. You can find it in the Generate section or I love Blender's uh, search features. So I'm just gonna press C. That's gonna pull up all the objects or the options that have the C starting there. So I'm gonna do Curve to Tube. And that's basically gonna turn our curve into this nice little tube super appropriately named. <laughs> and we used to be able to do something similar to this by grabbing the data properties and going to the geometry, but basically we're getting tons of extra options on there. So just to run through them quickly, you can change the profile from the default round to obviously you could go through and select a custom profile from a different object. Uh, you can have the option to shade this smooth or not. Um, the caps, the resample basically is the resolution along this axis. You can choose how you're doing that. For me, I'm gonna leave that alone for now. Caps determines whether or not you want the ends to be filled, so that can be handy, and it also might be needed to get rid of them for certain applications. And then what's really cool is that you also get a UV map by default. So I'm just gonna set this to something like 32 just so I get a rounder shape. And then I have this material from Grayscale Gorilla imported. It's the Atari Red Paracord. It's really cool that we have um, Grayscale Gorilla assets in Blender, so I'm just gonna import one of those into the scene, and I'm just gonna add it. I've already imported it, so I'm gonna assign it here, and then if I go into render view, you will see that that uh, paracord actually is mapped to the curve and it's dynamic. So I can then you know change any of these and the UV map is gonna line up appropriately. So doing stuff like chords or you know anything where you have a long mesh like a you know extension cord or something, it's super nice to kind of have a little set default with UV maps. And this is gonna be used for a lot more than just strings. I think I've seen some really cool examples on Twitter and different places where people are using this in a full geometry node setup. But yeah, just another little neat feature that we get in Blender 5.0. Okay, the next thing that we're going to talk about in Blender 5.0 is the ability to use a larger internal working space with colors. So now if you go over here to the render settings, you can scroll down to your working space. And before, you, your internal working space inside of Blender was limited to Rec. 709. You now have the ability to set it to Rec. 2020 and Aces CG. For most Blender users, this probably isn't something that will affect them on their day to day, but if you do a lot of work with clients that have a very specific color reference, um, this is a really cool way to standardize Blender 5.0 into the ACES CG pipeline. But then you also just get a wider range of colors and Christopher 3D has some really great videos. I'd recommend you check out um, his channel for some more information on this. But I'm gonna put on the screen now two renders. One of them is this exact client project that I worked on where they had a color palette of sticky notes they wanted me to animate. The old Rec. 709 color space looked like this, and then if you swap it to the updated version of Aces CG, which has a larger internal color space, you get even more saturated values. So if I'm just going to swap between them, you'll kind of see what these look like. So this is another big improvement for Blender 5.0. You do have the ability to jump in and change your internal working space. And like I said, most people might not use this on a day to day, but if you do a lot of very specific color work, this can be a big upgrade. Okay, the next topic that I wanna go through for Blender 5.0 is gonna be the changes to the compositor. And I think this one is gonna be one that Blender users will really uh, get a lot of use out of and it will really change the accessibility to people that aren't used to compositing. Blender 5.0 now ships with these really cool presets and they're basically just built node groups that you can drag straight from here into your scene. So this is just the render that I just showed earlier with these like colorful sticky notes. And then in the compositing tab, so I'm in the layout tab, but you could also just go to the compositing tab. I'm in here and I'm gonna start doing some little tricks. So let's say I'm looking at this and I go, hey, I want this to feel a little bit more punchy and I wanna see a little bit more contrast in my colors. Before, you would basically have to know how to do everything from scratch or maybe you've watched YouTube videos and saved node groups to your you know, startup file. But now Blender ships with these really awesome presets. So the ones that I dragged in when I was messing with this were, first of all, I wanted to add a little bit of chromatic aberration. And so you can just go down here and drag that chromatic aberration into your scene and then you can't drag it directly into the node tree. Um, that's one thing I've noticed from some people. So you're just gonna drag it in and then you can obviously just press G and set it in there and you now have some chromatic aberration. And then the hotkeys to look at your uh, view or view your render, make sure your backdrop is turned on so that you'll actually see, see the image. And then V and Alt V are what you use to zoom in. So if I zoom in here, you'll see you're getting a little bit of nice chromatic aberration. I have it set to 0 0.05 for mine. So I'm just gonna set that. Um, I'm not going to recreate all these, but I just did want to show how quickly you could add these super cool presets. I'm going to zoom back out with Alt-V or with V, 
And then I'm just gonna plug in these that I was messing with. And this only took me a few minutes to just plug in here and see what that would look like. So if I grab all these and I'm gonna mute them, you'll see that the image uh, just gains a lot of saturation and pop. So I mean, first of all, the chromatic aberration might be a little bit strong. So I'm gonna turn that back down a little bit. But overall, when I mute these, you can see that the image overall has more saturation. Adding a little bit of vignette helps draw my eye inward. And these were just the stock presets. I grabbed the chromatic aberration, I grabbed this tune image, and I'm using this color boost and clarity, which these are actually really, really neat. This one specifically changes everything about how this image feels. It really adds a lot of saturation and color back. And I think that's something that if you tried to do it, you know, with certain other tools, you wouldn't get that same effect. So the Blender Compositor really has some awesome effects here. They have an unsharp mask, a tune image, split toning, which is really neat. There's a sepia filter, um, the vignette, which I used. You can also add noise, film grain and sensor noise, which is so cool. You can just, you know, it's also animated. So for your, your animation, it will change per frame. So I think that a lot of Blender users will be able to jump into the compositor and go, hey, like I want my image to feel a little bit more punchier. I want it to feel like it has a little bit of a vignette. Just some really awesome artistic control to the new uh, Blender 5.0 compositor. Okay, another big thing for Blender 5.0 is it is now out of the experimental phase. If you go look up here in your uh, render settings, in between the engine and the device, there used to be an option to choose either the supported or experimental version, and the experimental had some extra features. And one of those that you can now do in just the base setup is adaptive subdivision. So what adaptive subdivision does is it just looks from the camera or the render perspective, and it basically breaks up the geometry of whatever you apply your subdivision to in a way that you have the most polygons toward the camera and less far away. And this is really good for shots where you're doing like gravel or anything where there's a lot of displacement that you want to keep a bunch of detail but you want to cut down your render costs so to set that up all you do is go to your modifiers whatever object you want to add it to you just add your subdivision surface and then you just check this adaptive subdivision and then to just give you a little preview i have a little base set up with a wireframe shader plugged into this uh, plane which thanks to christopher 3d again for kind of walking this same setup but if you go into camera view and then i'm just going to turn both of these into rendered view and then for this one, I'm going to go to the top. And this is basically just giving you an idea of what's happening here. So the geometry really close to the plane is being subdivided a lot so that if you then had a displacement or whatever you're going to use to drive that noise for the displacement, it's now going to be calculated with smaller polygons. And then all this way at the end, at the very back of what the camera is seeing, you don't need that much subdivision for that area. So then you can obviously adjust the pixel size and the viewport. It's going to be set to eight pixels by default. And then the lower that you slice um, this number, so it starts off with one pixel um, variation but then the lower you bring this the more it's going to increase your render time but the more detail you'll get in your geometry here so the adaptive subdivision is another big feature that um, is now stable and you can use it for all your gravel or for you know textures or any type of thing we're going to do displacement in blender 5.0 Okay, some final thoughts on Blender 5.0. I don't have time to go into a detailed breakdown of each of these, but there have been some really awesome cycles updates. The subsurface scattering algorithm and improvements have been made to where this just functions really nicely. Um, metallic thin film, you can go and create a really realistic iridescence and other effects with the updated metallic thin films. Volumes also got a really substantial update to where if you've done some Blender renders before with a volume, a lot of times you can get this really blocky effect that happens where, especially when volumes collide, that's been updated. Geonodes bundles, you can now have in, in geometry nodes a way to pass a whole system of information in through one uh, major little bundle, and then you can basically call that out later, which is really, really cool. Grease pencil, I don't do a bunch of grease pencil, but it now has a motion blur by default when you're rendering using grease pencil, so a lot of you know artists are now able to jump in and you get this nice little effect. You can do it in a bunch of little hacky ways, but it's now built in. And then the last little feature, this is totally not a big deal to other people, but to me, if I have tons of collections, so like for, let's say in this example, I have a collection inside of a collection inside of a collection beforehand, I would have had to move this into a collection by doing M. And then you had to hold your mouse over each of these to get down into where you want to go. Whereas now there's a little search feature, so I can just type, you know, text and it's going to pop up anything that has text in it. And then bam, my text goes in there where right where I want it. So overall, this um, update has just really improved some of the UI. It's improved a lot of stuff with rendering, just continuing to make Blender 5.0 more mainstream. I think that Aces CG and, um, you know, obviously Blender winning the Oscar. And there's been a lot of things that are really continuing to push Blender forward. I'm just excited to see uh, where everything's going to end up. And that's a wrap on Blender 5.0. There is so much I couldn't cover in this video, but this update is definitely one of the biggest yet with tools that'll level up your 3D workflow. Be sure you're subscribed to School of Motion so that you don't miss any motion design content coming out. And also drop a comment below and let us know which feature you're most hyped about. We'd love to hear what you think. Thanks for watching. And as always, happy blendering.